All right, let me uh, greet you this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to see you here. Invite all those that are in the cafe to come on in, and we'll go ahead and, and get started. Yeah, good to see you all. Um, I don't see quite as many people as usual. This is uh, kind of the height of vacation season, but for those of you who are here, that is great. Uh, I just want to remind us that it's great to be with each other, but most of all, uh, we're here to worship the Lord, and He's the one who we're going to give our attention to first thing this morning. Um, so I invite you to stand with me, and uh, we stand, you know, just as a, a posture of worship, and uh, just to tell ourselves that we're just not here to, to relax, but we're here um, to engage, to actively go before the Lord. Um, so sit and stand as you're comfortable during worship, but uh, um, be intentional we want to be intentional. The Lord is very intentional. He, he is outside of time, and yet He made this moment. He created today and this place, and we want to welcome Him into the today and into this time. So, Father, we come before You. We thank You that it's Your desire to meet with us this morning. It's the, we thank You that in this moment, in this place, it is Your desire to be here. So we welcome You. We listen. We hear the knock at the door. We say, Lord Jesus, come in. We say, Holy Spirit, we give You Lordship. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. With your freedoms, just pour forth this morning as our praise pours forth. Lord, we, wa we love you with our praise. We, we worship you with our words, with our hearts. We give you glory. And we say this morning belongs to you, ourselves, each of one in this room. And this ministry belongs to you. Would, you. would you take your rightful place? We raise the cross of Christ over us. We plead the blood of Jesus over us. We say, Lord God. May this be a divine moment. Come, Holy Spirit. Just invite all of you to continue to worship. Begin to worship in your heart. Let our worship start with our heart, not with the songs. Let the songs be the uh, carry us, carrying us, but may it begin in our hearts. Lord, we worship you from the depths of our hearts. Our spirit to yours. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to
Father, we just thank you that you made a way. Lord, we glorify your name. We lift high your name. We praise you. For you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you shall reign forever and ever. You alone shall reign and rule in our hearts forever and ever. We just give you all the glory this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, He's never let me down, He's faithful So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. And I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. Well, I won't be.
house was built on you. song I just really feel like that's a battle cry that some of us have just believed the lies they're so familiar sometimes we just believe wrong things and we just buy into it it's hopeless it's helpless but the truth is is that Jesus arm is not too short His promises, his words are true. And he won't fail you. He's committed. He's committed to the things that he has placed in you. And um, he just asks us to stop looking at the problem and start looking at the problem solver. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. So he won't fail. People will fail. Ideologies will fail. But he won't. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your commitment to us. Thank you that you love us. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Sweet to trust. 
Of that old hymn. I don't know if you picked up, I picked up on something in the chorus there I thought was really interesting. How I've proved him o'er and o'er. How I've proved him over and over. How do we prove him? It's when we've trusted in the something and then he has come faithful. That's how we've proved him when we've trusted him, especially when there's a place where it doesn't seem like he's, he could be trusted or there's something beyond what we can think is going to come that he could do and we trust him and then he proves himself trustworthy he has been faithful so I just want to get practical here for a moment get real okay I want to sing this chorus again but I want to do that let's do this let's prove him again so where is it in your life that there's something in your life that you are questioning or even something you've brought to him many many times and you're starting to doubt how about proving Jesus this morning by trusting him again? Think of that very thing in your mind. Bring it before the Lord and say, I want to prove you trustworthy again. I want to show you trustworthy one more time. So take a moment, maybe close your eyes. Think of that place, that struggle, that desire that you have, that doubt that you have. And the band's going to sing 
this chorus again. We're going to sing the chorus. And when you get to that verse, every word, every word but that particular phrase, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. It's not for us to prove his trustworthiness. It's for us to trust him and watch him prove himself to be trustworthy. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust, how I proved him all in Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him. more time let your praise we trust you Lord God yes Lord God Yes, Lord God, we put you to the test this morning. We put you to the test of your own trustworthiness. We declare that you are trustworthy. You are faithful. You are always for us and will never leave us or forsake us. Lord God, we bring our prayers, our thoughts, our concerns before you. And we put you to the test. Lord God, prove yourself trustworthy once again. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Stay in this place of worship. I just want to transition to um, the offering and invite the ushers to come up. And even before we sang this song, I had a phrase in my mind that I, that I was remembering that fits exactly with what this song was. And that was Jeff Collins, our friend Jeff that most of us know. Uh, he was talking to me one time, and um, he was talking about how sometimes, you know, there's been some hardships financially. Sometimes when he's been on, you know, just didn't have anything, he's out there being an itinerant minister. And when he was really empty, he would turn to his wife, Millicent, and say, we're going to have to give our way out of this one. We're going to have to prove God trustworthy, is what he was saying, just like we were just saying. And I don't say that to manipulate anybody here. You know why? Because a, manip a manipulated offering is not an offering. I'm not manipulating you. But I'm saying what we just sung is true even right now. And I believe that there's some in this room that, oh, man, I've got to hang on to what I have. Or you may need to say, I need to continue to have the favor of the Lord. I need his help. And the way I'm going to have his help is by trusting him. And in my declaration of offering, opening my hand so that I open up a flow of his unlimited resources to us and to us. So Lord God, we offer ourselves, not only our, our desires and our hearts, but also Lord, we open a channel of your faithfulness, your trustworthiness, your provision to us with this offering. It's not our desire to buy anything from you. It's not our desire to manipulate you. It's not our desire to do anything other than to give you honor and open a flow of heaven's resources. Lord God, I believe that they're available to us. There are, there are resources that are from you, and you are not asking us to simply endure, but you are asking us to trust you. And so with these offerings, we give you praise, and with these offerings, we say we trust you as our Heavenly Father as the Lord who provides all that we need at all times for all things. Receive our offering. And Lord, will we find you faithful once again. In Jesus' name, I invite you to come during this song. Sing with your heart and give with your hands. He came from glory to on flesh to save the lost grace and mercy displayed upon the cross, our redemption. He's the hope for all mankind, one name over everything. One name over everything. song for all 
For, uh, for help. Jesus Christ is our helper. But it's most important that we say Jesus Christ is Lord. That Jesus Christ is our helper because he's our Lord and we bow before him where he has lordship. Where we give him lordship, then he can be our Lord and he can provide and bring all that he is for us and to us. Yeah, one more time. Let's just praise the Lord one more time. The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. All right. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Take, the, take some of the joy that's in your heart. Share that with those around you. Welcome them here this morning. Find someone you don't know, especially. Say hi to them. All right, I'm going to invite the children to make their way back here to Miss Kathy this morning. I just love the fellowship. I love the community. Um, we're just going to invite the kids to uh, make their way back over here to Miss Kathy, getting ready for summer splash, right? Going outside? You're not going outside. Last time you didn't go outside because it rained. Now why aren't you going outside? I don't know. I got to. 
I got I to gotta let them do their thing. I got to, <laughs> I'll, I'll withhold my opinion. No, have a great, let's, let's pray for me and the kids. Let's, um, Oh, Lord Jesus, you know these children, and you love them, and you will bless them wherever they are. So I pray that you will bless them in the classroom. You will bless them not only in what you share with them, but in the intimacy, the intimacy of your heart with theirs. Lord, I pray for the leaders that they would uh, make the adjustments that they need to do for this morning and have a great morning. And, Lord, would this be a significant morning in their lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Kathy and Dawn, for filling in this morning. Um, even some of our staff have to take vacation as well, so uh, Jen is away, and um, they're, great, they're in great hands. Okay, a um, couple things I just want to share with you. Uh, we, I don't think any of them are new, but just remind you of them. Um, there's a few different uh, things that are upcoming. First of all, um, in a couple of weeks, it's about three weeks, July 29th, which is a Saturday, the end of the month, um, there's churches, a number of churches in the city of Hartford, friends of ours, um, are having a, a whole summer of hope, but they're also having a day of hope at the, uh, uh, the Dunkin' Donuts uh, Stadium, which is where the Yard Goats play. It'll be from, from noon in the afternoon to 4 p.m. Um, it'll be worship and some ministry. Um, some of our folks are helping to man a prayer tent. Um, there's a lot of information you can find online. Go to our article in the e-news or on the website. Um, but that's coming up, and it'll be a great opportunity to join with others from other congregations and other backgrounds there at that uh, stadium right there in the north end of, of Hartford. So I encourage you to check that out. Also coming up, beginning a week from tomorrow, I believe, um, is our Vacation Bible School. And uh, there's still time to sign up for you if you want to be a helper or for your kids or for your neighbor's kids or your friend's kids. We want this to be open to everyone. So please, um, just uh, it's still open all the way up until the time that it starts. But the more we know who's coming, the better we'll be able to have the preparation and have everybody there. So that's coming up next week. And then a third announcement is that, uh, if you remember, uh, Cindy shared a great testimony last week about, about how the Lord has moved her um, to worship through movement. Specifically for her, it's been flags and other movement, but uh, she wants to just have a workshop. She's offering to have a workshop for all of us. Um, so if that connected with you or you weren't here and you'd like to know more about that, that's two weeks from today after the service. But you are going to have to register because lunch is going to be provided and we just need to know who's coming. So they will have a table in the cafe. Cindy will be out there be able to share some more information with you if you have any questions. Okay, so those are three of the things that are coming up. Uh, we also have an exciting thing. We've gone through some training again of some Stevens ministers. So I'm going to invite Nancy to come on up here and Pastor Rick, and they're going to, uh, to lead us through that. All right, Nancy. Good morning. Tell us what's going on. <laughs> Hello, I'm excited and happy to be here. Um, first, I want to start with um, a story in Mark. Quick one. Um, in, uh, in Mark chapter 14, Jesus has just um, gathered with his disciples in what we now know as the Lord's Supper. And after that, he invites his disciples to go with him to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there he asks them to be with him as he prays. And then he, said, he brings uh, Peter, James, and John with him. And he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Jesus asked his disciples for the gift of presence. Mm. And that is such a beautiful picture of the Stephen ministry that we have here at Wellspring. Our Stephen ministers train for 50 hours and then dedicate and commit themselves to a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a person in our church that is going through a difficult time in their life, whether it's an illness or a loss or um, a tragedy or whatever they're going through, they come alongside them. And it is such an honor and privilege to walk along some alongside someone to be a witness to their sorrow and to their grief and to their pain and to be with them and give them the gift of presence. 
And so that's what our Stephen ministers do. So I'd like to invite the three Stephen ministers that have just gone through training um, to come up here. And so we are going to commission these Stephen ministers after um, all the work that they've done. Um, one exciting thing that we had um, new with Stephen Ministry is we have two Spanish-speaking Stephen ministers now. And I'm just really excited about that. And it was really great that it was a smaller group because we were able to take the time to do some translating and, and really help, um, help with the training. And so I just invited um, Ramon to say a few, few words about the Stephen Ministry in Spanish. Good morning. Para la gente que habla español, es un programa para ayudar la gente que está pasando un tiempo duro para otro, para los otros ayudarte a caminar por por the problem is for you. And, and for me, it's a thing that I wanted to do much of it to help people because people helped me. And we're here for Hispanic people. Thank you. Thank you. So this is Ramon Rivera and John Ivan and Yolanda Rivera. And so we're gonna um, give them their certificates and then I invite Pastor Rick to pray and commission them. Yeah. Um, before I give these to these guys, just wanna reiterate something that Nancy shared. They've gone through 50 hours of training. It's very intense, it's very thorough. The purpose is to help them do what Nancy spoke about, to be a minister of presence, to, to be with someone as he or she goes through a life crisis. It could be grief, it could be loss of a job, it could be someone who's a caregiver uh, to someone who has uh, a lot of physical needs themselves, and they just they need a place to um, decompress, to speak about their feelings, it's an extraordinary ministry that we've had at Wellspring for a number of years. We kind of pushed pause for a little bit during uh, the pandemic, but we're, we've been back and running again. And I'm saying all this to, this to say, if you know of someone who might um, be a great candidate to be a care receiver uh, from the help and ministry of one of these Stephen ministers, you'll be out in the cafe, Nancy will be out in the cafe after the service, you can speak to her about if either you yourself or someone you know, hey, um, I know someone who would be uh, really in need of this ministry, then we will work to broker these relationships and to connect them one with another. So I um, wanted to give you that encouragement as well. So John, congratulations. Yolanda, all your hard work. And Ramon, you totally killed it in Spanish. <laughs> It was great. Now, if you, if you would just extend your hands toward them, and uh, I want to pray and lead us. Father, we thank you for these three. We thank you for their hearts, and we thank you for the training that they've received. And for our other Stephen ministers as well, Lord, we are grateful. We thank you, Lord, that um, these three and our other Stephen's ministers can be uh, your hands, your heart, your presence um, to those in our congregation who are walking through difficult times. So, Lord, we commend them to your ongoing care and help. Would you fill them afresh with your spirit? And we commission them, Lord, to do the work that they've been trained to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you. Bless you. Thanks, Nancy.
Well, in the, uh, in the passage uh, that's before us this morning, what we're going to look at, we're starting a series for the summertime uh, called Words of Jesus, and um, Pastor West and myself, I think John might get in on the fun as well, um, we're going to have opportunity to uh, just various passages in the Gospels to focus each week on, you know, part of the teaching of Jesus, the sayings of Jesus. Um, in the passage before us uh, today, we find a question or a variation of a question that's been a um, source of speculation, great speculation, you know, down through the centuries, actually. And um, it's the Pharisees of all people who ask Jesus here in Luke 17, I'll ask you to turn there in a moment. Uh, but they asked Jesus this question, when will the kingdom of God come? And it's clear by the context uh, that what they're asking about is the end of the age. Just as, you know, people down through the centuries have asked, you know, when will be the end of the world? When's the world going to end? Or for those of us with a Christian orientation, you know, we might phrase the question this way. When is Jesus coming back? Now... Um, these are not unimportant questions, um, and they can lead to all kinds of um, interesting secondary sets of questions. Uh, you know, what's it going to be like on the earth when the Lord returns? Um, what will be the signs of his coming? All of these kinds of questions that arise around that primary question. And um, I have to confess, um, you know, just as you know, I'm going into this teaching that I used to be a whole lot more taken by these questions and speculations than I am now. I once was way more fascinated uh, by this topic than I am currently. I mean, I began to be a serious follower of the Lord uh, during the height of the Jesus movement in the 70s. And you know, in the center of all of that energy and the enthusiasm um, just the power of the Spirit in that movement that we look back on and now call the Jesus movement or the Jesus revolution, there was a lot of speculation about the return of the Lord. A lot of books written, a lot of sermons preached about the signs of the times, prophetic timetables. And, you know, one book in particular many of you may have heard of. It's uh, been published a number of times over the years, The Late Great Planet Earth by a guy named Hal Lindsey, sold millions of copies, and was instrumental in uh, piquing the, um, you know, the interest of many people in searching out for their own personal relationship with Christ. And many people you know, came to know the Lord um, and came to faith through that book. But here's the deal. Um, you know, looking back, you know, it's been a long time since the 1970s, and um, a lot of the signs of the times that seemed pretty clear then, um, not so clear now. And much of the framework of that, you know, particular view of the end times and when the Lord is going to return have proven to be not exactly on target. So... I won't say I'm jaded, <laughs> Debbie might say I'm jaded, um, but my fascination has faded a bit with, not with the overall theme of scripture, my fascination with that of, you know, like what kinds of things are going to come together on the Lord's return. What kinds of things are going to be resolved? I mean, we sang earlier, and Amy pointed out in her prayer, like, we, we make this proclamation that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, and we say it so often, you know, that it almost becomes a trite phrase, but it, it captured my attention again this morning, like, what do we really mean when we, when we say that? And, um, you know, what it means is that he really is the king over all the other governments of the world. It's not seen now, but it will be seen then. And he really is the Lord over all the principalities and powers who act as lords over nations and over the peoples of the earth. And it's going to be revealed 
that he's the one to whom they will bow, you know, as it says, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Those themes fascinate me more than ever. All right, that was a little bit of an excursus there. Um, but again, you know, on this whole thing of like mapping out the timeline, I remember shortly after I got here, I told you about, you know, you know, when I first began following the Lord, this, was, this theme was like front and center. Um, I came here in 1986, shortly after we came here in 1987, I received a little paperback monograph uh, in the mail, it was published, you know, by the author, and uh, he'd gone to incredible exp expense, he had m literally mailed hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of copies of this little monograph, this small book, to pastors all across the country. I mean, I didn't ask for it. It just came in the mail for free. And uh, I opened it up and began to look at it and, uh, you know, just kind of peruse through, you know, this short book. And the thesis of the book was that uh, according to his understanding of Scripture and his discerning of the times, um, the, the point of the book was get ready because Jesus is coming back in September of 1987. <laughs> now, I hung on to the book for a while just, you know, to have it as evidence and um, as a reminder to show others who might be prone to be caught up in the dangers, particularly of setting dates, about when the Lord's going to return. It's a fascinating question that the Pharisees asked Jesus. When will the kingdom of God come? All right, so let's pray. And then we're going to dive into this passage from Luke 17. Lord, we thank you for the sure promise that we have that you will return. And we thank you, Lord, for the seasons down through church history when attention about your return has heightened, Lord, because it's always been in times of revival and renewal and awakening. And Lord, there is a longing in our hearts that you would return and set things right upon this earth. And that's our great desire, that you would be seen for who you are and that the peoples of the earth would come to know you. And so, Lord, would you open this word to our understanding and open our hearts to the word. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if you got your Bibles, uh, open them to Luke chapter 17. And I want to just read um, this passage, and then we're going to work through it and then see how Jesus applies it to us. Luke 17, beginning with verse 20. Once, having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is among you. Next paragraph. Then he said to his disciples, The time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. Men will tell you, there he is, or this is the one, here he is. Do not go running after them. For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. 
It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the roof of his house with his goods inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed, one will be taken, and the other left. And two women will be grinding grain together, one will be taken, and the other left. Where, Lord? they asked. And he replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Lord, we ask your help to understand this passage. And um, we also pray, Lord, that our hearts would be responsive to how you apply it to us. And we pray all this, Lord, in your name. Amen. Okay. Back to verse 20. Um, The essence of Jesus' answer here is that he's blowing off their question. I hope you see that. Uh, He's blowing off their question while at the same time, by calling them up short, he's giving them an opportunity to repent. Remember now, he, it says very clearly, and this is important as we understand this first paragraph, the question's been asked by the Pharisees of all people. And um, so we could accurately paraphrase Jesus' reply to them in this way. Don't waste your time doing calendar calculations or looking for signs in the heavens as to when the day of the Lord is coming. Don't you even get it? Can't you see? The kingdom of God is right here. It's been before you for three years. And you've missed it. I hope hope you can see and and sense some of the the, the intensity and the mood of Jesus as he responds to the Pharisees. He's not trying to smack talk them. But he is trying to call them up short. Remember, these are the religious leaders of his day. They're experts in the the, uh, Hebrew scriptures. They're the religious leaders of the people. They prayed every morning of their entire lives that the Messiah would come, that the kingdom would come. It's been before them for three years. And they've got no clue. So this is late in Jesus' ministry, His heart still goes out to them. It's like, can't you see you're completely blind? He's trying to break through their religious defenses because he's trying to give them an opportunity to repent and to receive the salvation that he's bringing near. And he's saying to them, you've missed it. Now, also, you've probably noticed in the reading of the text as I read it, um, I did some correcting of what is, for many people, a favorite mistranslation. Many versions do indeed translate the last phrase of verse 21 in this way, the kingdom of God is within you. Many of you probably heard teachings on this phrase, the kingdom of God is within you may have read books about it, devotionals, heard sermons. And it sounds really good, I know. And it feels really good to say to yourself, to encourage you or to encourage someone else, like, the kingdom of God is within you. You have the Holy Spirit. You have everything that you need. It's right at your disposal. It's all there. The kingdom of God is within you. Glory, hallelujah. And it is glorious. It's a glorious expression. But I can guarantee you that's not what Jesus was saying that day to the Pharisees. The last person, the last people that Jesus would say the kingdom of God is within you are to the Pharisees. 
They've resisted him every step of the way. Their hearts are stone cold to the kingdom. He's not saying to them, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, it is true, this little Greek uh, preposition, entos, is usually translated within. But it can also mean among, within reach, in your midst. And the keys to translation are, what are the potential meanings of the word? And then, what's the context? And in this context, it's pretty clear that what Jesus is saying to them, the kingdom of God is standing right in front of you. The kingdom of God is within your reach. If you would but humble yourself and strip yourself of all of your religious, not just your religious garments, but your supposed religious understanding, and like the everyday people all around you, if you would just humble yourselves and repent, the kingdom of God would be within your reach. And you could have the very thing that I've come to bring near to you. And so Jesus is... He's dismissing their question, but he's doing it in a way that he hopes to pierce their defenses, that they too, before it's too late, might grab the salvation that he's come near to bring. All right, let's keep moving. Verse 22. Jesus now, this is so fascinating to me. The the Pharisees ask him the question. He doesn't give them the answer, but then he turns to his disciples And he answers the Pharisees' question to his disciples. I love this. He turns to his disciples. Let's read verses 22 through 25. Then he said to his disciples, The time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. Men will tell you, there he is, or here he is. Do not go running after them. For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Now, Jesus speaks to his disciples about the days of the Son of Man. It's clear in this context, and I want to do a little bit of background on this phrase, Son of Man, that what Jesus is talking about to his disciples is the end times. He's answering the very question that the Pharisees raised, but he's, he's giving this revelation to his followers, to his disciples. The days of the Son of Man are, it's a comparable phrase to what we would say the end times. In Daniel chapter 7, the prophet Daniel has a vision of a glorious person, quote, one like unto a Son of Man, that is a human being, approaching earth, descending on a glorious cloud out of heaven. That's the only messianic use of the phrase son of man in the entire Hebrew Bible. It's used on other occasions. The prophet Elijah, I mean not Elijah, Ezekiel, um, likes to use it of himself, and God addresses Ezekiel as a son of man because it can mean um, a son of the human family a human being, a person, a son of man. But it can also mean by this reference to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, it can mean the glorious Messiah, the glorious coming one. And it's interesting that Jesus, he, ca- he used this phrase, which is, it does have, like I said, one messianic reference in the Old Testament, but for the most part, it's not it's, it was not a primary messianic title that was in use uh, in Judaism of his day, like the son of David or the son of God. Uh, he, didn't, he, he didn't use any of those phrases to refer to himself. His primary term to speak about himself as the son of man, and m- my understanding of this is that the ambiguity in the phrase is something that Jesus you know, really liked about the phrase. And so he is speaking here about the end times. And what he's saying to his disciples is that, you know, the end is not around, right around the corner. Certain things need to happen before the end comes, including, most specifically, Jesus said, it's important for me, it's necessary for me to suffer. 
He has a day with the cross upcoming and to be rejected by the religious leaders of his day. Jesus said this needs to come first. He also clearly implies, you know, in this, in this explanation to his disciples, um, that there will be difficult days ahead for them, be difficult times for his followers, times when they will be wishing for his return. He says in, in verse 22, the time is coming when you will long to see the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. And uh, then verse 23, he warns them, you know, men will tell you he's coming back in September 1987. (laughs) Don't bother with that nonsense. Don't be fooled. Don't follow after such speculation. And then verse 24, he says, you know, when the Son of Man does return, it will be like lightning flashing across the sky. Now, a couple things about this analogy that Jesus uses here. Number one, uh, you, no one can tell you exactly when lightning is going to flash. Now, if you see a bolt of lightning, you know thunder's following, but the lightning comes first. So we, you know, like if we're, we kind of know the conditions when lightning is possible, is likely. You know, it feels like a thunderstorm's brewing. But nobody can look at their watch and say, oh, you know, in 10 seconds, the lightning's going to flash. You you can't do that. And the second thing about this analogy is that when lightning does come, everybody knows it. I mean, it flashes across the sky. Everyone is aware. You cannot keep lightning a secret. And that's what Jesus is saying about his return. All right, let's keep moving. And I want to read the next two paragraphs again. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man, Son of Man. In that time, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And then the flood came and destroyed them all. And it was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. All right, there's two, these are two parallel references uh, from the book of Genesis. The first is Genesis chapter 6. And Jesus is speaking about the days of Noah prior to the coming of the flood. And the second is from Genesis chapter 19, the days prior to the release of judgment upon the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the point in each instance, each of these examples that Jesus is referencing to his disciples, is that you know, like one day, one hour, even one minute before the judgment was released, the rain in the time of Noah, the fire and brimstone when Lot left Sodom, right up until the time, right up until the last minute, everything looked normal. People are eating and drinking. They're marrying and giving in marriage. They're buying and selling. They're planting. They're building. (coughs) Excuse me. Everything's normal. You know, life seemed pretty normal at 8.45 a.m. on the 11th of September, 2001. But 100 seconds later, the first plane crashed into the North Tower, and the world changed. Most of us here lived through that moment, and we know what it felt like to be on one side or the other of that world-changing event. And Jesus says, it will be just like this on the day that the Son of Man is revealed, like a lightning strike. And then everything forever changes. Because at that point, what he's saying, you cannot, there'll be no turning back the clock. All right. Let's keep going here. 
let's, let me look back at this, at this verse, verse 30. <clears throat> it will be just like this on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Jesus, again, is using this term from Daniel chapter 7. And at that time, the glorious Son of Man, this Jesus, who's standing there before his disciples, now crucified, risen, and at that point in time, the one who's returned, he will be revealed for all to see. Now, let's look at what follows. Pick up in verse 30, and we'll continue. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the roof of his house with his goods inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. And then a key to, I think a key to understanding what Jesus is saying here is in verse 32. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed, one will be taken and the other left, and two women will be grinding grain together, and one will be taken and the other left. Now, what Jesus paints here is a very sobering scenario, and it's intensified by the words of application um, that he plants right in the middle you know, of these two little snippets, these two little scenarios that he's painting. And uh, before we go any further, I want to just pause here, and um, I want to raise and then like set aside some questions that might be forming in, in some of your minds. Um, you may be asking, you know, like particularly if you've done some study on this topic of the end times, you may have read some books, we've got, you know, Brian's here this morning, he's written a book about this. Some of you may have invested a lot of time and energy in studying this. So you might be asking yourself, like, exactly what is Jesus describing here? Where, you know, when he, where is he on the end times timeline? You know, is he talking here about, you know, the rapture of the saints up to heaven that will trigger the great tribulation? Or is he, is he talking about Jesus' glorious return that will usher in the millennium? Where does, you know, this scenario that Jesus is talking about, where does it fit, you know, in the sequence of the final days? Now, like I said, for some of you, these are really familiar questions, familiar considerations that you've given some study and thought and attention to. And for others of you, these questions sound like, what the heck is he talking about up there? It sounds like theological Swahili. Well, I raise these questions <coughs> just to raise them, and then, but I want to set them aside. And here's why. I don't want to impose these questions on what Jesus is saying here. Let's just stick with what Jesus is saying without trying to fit it into what is a preconceived framework in our own thinking. I'm aware of the various end-time scenarios, and prophetic charts and timelines. I'm, I'm very aware of those. I've studied them down through the years, but I've come to this conclusion. I don't have a great... I'm, I'm going to make a, a, a bold statement, and then I'm going to tell you why I've come to this conclusion. I'm not all that confident in any biblical interpreter's capacity to accurately discern how all the various, many, and varied prophetic passages in the entire scripture can be accurately woven together to present one clear timeline. And the reason I'm skeptical about that is I've been wrong so many times. Seriously. <coughs> and so, what my study has brought me to is a place of humility that I'm just not sure how all of these passages fit together. And that doesn't mean that raising the questions is the wrong thing to do, and I certainly don't mean to imply it's a waste of time. I'm just, I've been wrong so much that 
I've just taken a step back and I've trying to see the big picture without having any confidence in myself to piece all of this together. Does that make sense? So I want to just stick with the words of Jesus and then focus on the application that he brings here in this passage before us. So we pick up in verses 34 and 35. There's two scenarios here that he's painting. I tell you on that night, two people will be in one bed. Presumably they're married. (laughs) Two people will be in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Now, both of these scenarios are like, if you get two people in the same bed, you're pretty close together. I mean, they didn't have king-sized beds in first century uh, Israel. And two women who are grinding grain together, it's a... One woman's pouring the grain into the press. The other woman is working the press, the grinder. And so they're they're right beside one another. And in each case of this picture that Jesus is painting, one is taken and the other is left. Okay, the clear idea here is separation. Separation. First a married couple, then two friends closely working together. One's taken, the other stays. So the obvious questions are, is the one taken, taken up to heaven and saved? Or is the one taken, taken off to judgment? Jesus doesn't say. And I've looked at a lot of different interpreters, and uh, it's pretty much split right down the middle. <coughs> But I don't really think it matters. The point is clear. And the point is this. Be ready. Be ready. And for his disciples, for his followers, because that's who Jesus is talking to here. Remember, the Pharisees raised the question, but Jesus turned to the disciples and gave the answer to them. Jesus presses his point And this is what he's saying to us. And what Jesus is saying here in this discussion, and I want to, I want to just kind of back up and 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 like make another aside here. I I I don't in any way want to insinuate or leave you with the impression that the study of these end time prophecies is a waste of time or is just an exercise in foolish speculation. I I don't want to leave that impression at all. The Lord gave these prophecies. He gave these revelations for a reason, for a purpose. Um, But even though this is a tough topic, um, it's not exactly beach time reading. It's not what we might call summertime fair. But these are the words of Jesus. So I just want to stick with you know, with Jesus' words here. And the main point that Jesus is making in this passage is this. What he's saying is make sure that your loyalties, make sure that your hearts, make sure that your affections are fixed upon the things of the kingdom and not the things of this world. And the reason I'm so confident in saying that I mean, there's a lot of reasons that are embedded in the text, but one is just like, it, I mean, it just jumps right out of the passage. Verse 32, three powerful words. Remember Lot's wife. Wow. That, you know, that hit me this week as I was going over this, like, just like a two before between the eyes. Remember Lot's wife. What a statement. Now, Let's back up and just give the details of the story from Genesis 19. Lot was a righteous man. He was Abraham's nephew. And they both had huge flocks of sheep and goats, and they couldn't all stay in the the same place. And so Abraham said to Lot, you choose where you want to go, and I'll go the other direction. And Lot chose to pitch his tent towards Sodom. And then eventually he and his family lived in the city of Sodom. And Lot was a righteous man, but Sodom... Is a city was a city so wicked that its name has become synonymous with iniquity. 
And Genesis 19 tells us that the Lord was so grieved by the depth and the pervasiveness of the sin of that city that he sent two angels to go and inspect it firsthand. And also the two angels were to go to Lot's family, to go to Lot and to warn him to flee because judgment was coming. And so in the story, Lot and his family do flee, but on their way to the hills, Lot's wife looks back. And the judgment that was falling upon the iniquity of Sodom tragically engulfs her. Because she, <coughs> excuse me, she's looking back with longing for what she's leaving behind. She's looking back with longing for the comforts, for the material things, for the pleasures, the familiar things of that wicked city. And so the, as the judgment falls upon the city, it engulfs her as well. Now, as I said earlier, um, I know this story, these warnings about judgment, it's, I don't know, it's, it's not summertime reading. But they are the words of Jesus, and that's what we're focusing upon this summer. So let's focus on what Jesus focuses upon here and the application he makes. Verse 31, he says, On that day, no one who is on the roof of his house with his goods inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I don't think verse 31 is Jesus giving a practical piece of advice. You know, don't, don't even bother going back inside. What he's saying is, like, because he attaches it to Lot's wife. He says, when that day comes, when my return comes, make sure that your eyes are fixed upon me and my coming and the kingdom which is finally going to be ushered into this earth when I'm going to set everything that's gone wrong right. I'm going to bring justice to the injustice of this world. The glorious dimension of the rule of God is going to be made manifest for all the nations. Make sure that you're captivated by that and not by your big screen TV. Don't go back inside and get your favorite pair of shoes. Remember Lot's wife. <laughs> Remember Lot's wife. And then this... And he goes back to like the very beginning word, like the call. His, Jesus' call to discipleship always begins with this radical invitation. If you want to find your life, lose it. For whoever will seek to, like, okay, you've, you've chosen to follow me in the ways of the kingdom, but if you're like Lot's wife and you say, well, you know, I really love Jesus, <laughs> But I really love the things of this world, too. And I, maybe I can have them both together. Wouldn't that be great? Anybody ever thought that? Yeah, we all have. But this is this basic call to radical discipleship. You know, the Sermon on the Mount comes to mind. Matthew 6, Seek first. What? The kingdom of God. And his righteousness. Seek first me and my kingdom, and let all the rest, like Pastor West led us earlier, I'll prove that I'm faithful. I'll prove I can take care of you. You don't have to worry about those things. Seek me first in my kingdom. Whoever seeks to hang on to her life, whoever seeks to hang on to the things of this world, whoever seeks to balance my lesser affections with this glorious devotion to the glorious king, we put ourselves in danger of our soul being twisted and even lost, forfeiting the very thing that the Lord came to bring us. And so in this little teaching about the last days, Jesus' main application is to remind all of us of this this primary call to radical discipleship. The Christian life is not about me getting my blessings. 
The Christian life is not about end time speculations. The Christian life is not about me adding a little bit of religion to my life resume. It's surrendering my will to Jesus. It's laying down my life to follow him. It's caring about and caring for. It's being about the things that are most important to him. And that's what Jesus is saying here. That's his primary message in this teaching as he seeks to answer the question that the Pharisees raise about when is the kingdom of, com- of God coming? All right. I want to bring this to a close. And like I've said more than once already, like I don't know why I decided to preach on this first. Maybe... I wasn't thinking too clearly, and then I got in the midst of it, and it's already on the schedule. It's like, oops, here we are. Okay. Well, as I said, it's not light fair. But as, I, as we apply it, I want to apply it to myself. I'm just going to be, just like, put it out there. Like, so I'm working on this this week, and I don't know if you noticed it or not, but this week is really hot. It's really hot and it's really humid. And slam in the middle of the week is the 4th of July. And, um, you know, so, you know, fireworks and, you know, picnics and all that stuff. And, you know, and also, like, for the first time in a million years, you know, my hometown baseball team is, like, really playing amazingly well. (laughs) And, uh, so I'm, you know, like, I'm going through this, and then I get to this, you know, verse 33, whoever tries to keep his life will lose, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I'm like, oh, oh, Jesus, you just killed me. (laughs) Because that's what I was trying to do. It's easy to get distracted. It's real easy to get distracted. Even in the worst of times, life is pretty good for most of us compared to the rest of the world. And I found myself, as I'm preparing to share with you, under conviction of the Holy Spirit. Like, Rick, you better, you better get things in order, like in your own heart. And I was reminded of a prayer I used to pray every day. And I can't say I haven't prayed in a long time, but I don't pray it as regularly as I used to. And every day, I used to pray, Lord, would you consume me with zeal for your house? Would you consume me with zeal for your name? Would you consume me with zeal for your kingdom? And I had to admit to myself, and now I'm admitting to all of you, like, I haven't prayed that prayer as regularly as I used to. And that's what the Holy Spirit was reminding me of this week. And what he was saying was, don't be like Lot's wife. When you've set your gaze on this glorious thing called the kingdom of God, don't look back. And don't get trapped in lesser affections and secondary loyalties. Because the kingdom is here, and it's coming, and it's worth selling out everything to go after. I'm going to invite you to stand. I want to give each of you a moment just to respond to whatever the Lord's saying to you. Lord, we am so grateful for the prayer of the psalmist who says, you remember our frames. You know that we are but dust. 
Lord, you know our frailties, you know our weaknesses, our inconsistencies. Lord, I pray that you would have mercy upon us and hold us. By your grace, Lord, would you hold us to our highest loyalties. Lord, would you keep us, help us to stay fixed on the things that are most important. And Lord, I pray that we would not be like Lot's wife or like the man who's on the roof of his house and says, I got to go back inside and get this when the kingdom is exploding all around him. Lord, we want to be about the things that you're about. And would you help us keep our loyalties pure and strong and fixed? And Lord, we do pray for your kingdom to come and your will to be done. And we do pray, Lord, for your soon return. Because we want everyone to see how beautiful you are and how glorious this thing called the kingdom of God is. And we want to see the phonies and the charlatans and the fakes of this world revealed for what they truly are and see the righteousness of the kingdom put on display. Help us, Lord. Even in the midst of heat waves, help us. And help us to stay fixed and sure. And we pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to invite the prayer ministers to come forward. They'll be here at the altar. If you have need for a miracle in your life, a healing physically, or some situation that you're facing, they'll be glad to pray with you and for you. Hope you have an amazing week. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.